In the previous video, we covered a bunch of reasons that the antenna connected with an ADC followed by digital processor doesn't work well for radio frequencies. One of them, for example, was that the signal is so weak that would actually require a 100 decibels amplifier at the input of ADC to get the signal at the desired level. And, this is a big no, with a big difficulty, especially for handheld devices, we can't do that. So, the natural question that comes is then, why we choose to work with radio frequencies? Why don't we try some alternatives? And this is a fair question, because the fundamental principle is that the vast majority of signals, such as, for example, voice and video, essentially get encoded into bits today, and most of them occupy just a few kilohertz up to maybe just a few megahertz of bandwidth. Our voice takes just a few kilohertz to transmit, and video, even high-definition video takes just a few megahertz. So one might say, look, I have to transmit a signal that extends roughly from DC to a megahertz or two, or maybe five or ten depending on the situation, why are you asking me to go all the way to an RF band to work at gigahertz? Why do you take the spectrum that was here, and now you're asking me to transmit it here? That's the basic question. So the answer to this question is by actually looking at what would have happened if we were to try to transmit the baseband signal directly from an RF transmitter and receive it from an RF receiver. So the first thing that we have here is that there are some difficulties regarding antennas. From fundamental electromagnetics for a structure like this dipole antenna to efficiently radiate a signal or efficiently receive a signal, it needs to be somewhat large than the wavelength of the signal. And the rule of thumb is that most antennas that basically transmit efficiently have to be somewhere between a quarter of a wavelength to half a wavelength. And if one is pretty good in antenna design and willing to make a little bit of a compromise in terms of efficiency and in terms of bandwidth, maybe one can push this down to perhaps 0.1 wavelength. So less than that becomes really problematic. And there are niche applications where we do that, but let's just pick this as a rule of thumb. So if we actually do try to transmit at, let's say, 1 GHz, then the length of antenna has to be, let's say, 0.1 times the wavelength. And so the wavelength at 1 GHz would be the speed of light in free space divided by the frequency, so is basically about 3 cm. So a 3 cm antenna, it's not that big of a deal, we can visualize how to fit it into an actual system, but let's do the same calculation for the baseband frequencies. So if we were to transmit, let's say a 1 MHz signal, if you actually do this calculation for 1 MHz, you will find out that the answer here is an impressive 30 meters. Now that's becoming a little bit of an issue. Nobody really likes to carry a 30 meter antenna with him. And for voice of 1 kHz, now, the length of antenna would be 30 kilometers. Does it mean that we transmit signals at 1 kHz? Yes, for unique applications, we do, but for everyday applications, we would hate to do that. That's one of the most important reasons why baseband transmission simply doesn't happen as the antenna becomes highly impractical. Now, the other reason, rarely we have signals of single frequency. They usually occupy a bandwidth. So if you try to transmit a video that occupies a bandwidth from 1 kHz to 1 MHz and we try to calculate the antenna size for such signal, should we be using the wavelength at 1 kHz or at 1 MHz or somewhere in the middle of the band? What is the right wavelength for this antenna? Well, the reality is that for signals that occupy a relatively wide bandwidth, there isn't really a resonant antenna like a dipole that will work well. You actually need a fairly wideband antenna to work well. And by wideband antenna, mean an antenna that can actually radiate well both the low frequency signal as well as the high frequency signal. And, easily, we'll measure the bandwidth, for example, by dividing the minimum frequency of the signal over the maximum frequency of the signal. So we'll say for example, f max over f min. And in this case, the bandwidth is this extremely high number of a thousand to one. Or what we'll actually divide is the maximum frequency of the signal minus the minimum frequency of the signal over the center frequency, and then we're going to talk about the fractional bandwidth of the antenna. Either way, whether we do f max over f min or the fractional bandwidth, where to actually transmit baseband, we would truly suffer in the sense that we would have to come up with antennas that are incredibly wideband, and that's a big challenge. It's not just a big design challenge, but it's a big implementation challenge. Wideband antennas like the ones listed here, definitely, first of all, those are not the thousand to one, but even if you can make a thousand to one antenna, you will actually end up with a fairly large structure. And so the second reason why we don't do direct baseband transmission is because if you do that, the f max over f min will actually be a very large number.
Now, compare this with a situation where you now don't do direct baseband transmission, but you actually center everything at 1 GHz, and now the bandwidth of your system is basically 1 MHz minus 1 kHz, if that matters, divided by 1 GHz, and that's really, really small. So working with antennas that essentially have very small fractional bandwidth, we're practically looking at the spectrum that looks something like this, just practically single frequency, which means not going to use small dipoles, they're going to use small resonant antennas. Life is good and the system works really well. So the second reason why we actually go for RF transmission and not baseband is because typically our fractional bandwidth would be much, much smaller than if we were to do direct baseband transmission. The other reason to mention is that we're not the only ones trying to transmit or receive. We don't create a silver network, for example, for just one user or two users, we create them for a lot of users. For example, for GSM can handle a thousand users at the same time. So somehow we have to find a way to share the channel. If everybody is transmitting baseband and all of our voices are roughly the same bandwidth, then we're screwed. Basically, the person who wins is the person who screams the loudest, and that's not the way it would go. So, for reasons of just sharing the channel, we have to find a way to give different frequencies to different applications, and there are many different ways we can do that. Among others, frequency division multiple access techniques and time division multiple access techniques are used for sharing channels. The other reason to mention is that of interference. One have to account for people who are transmitting in close bands. And how do we reject interference? Traditionally an RF receiver, antenna receive a composite signal. The receiver must have some type of filtering scheme that not only try to take the signal of interest, but also attenuate annoying interfering signals that may be close. Then there is this amplification. LNA, that's for low noise amplifier. And then finally, we have rest of the receiver. Now, if this interference is quite strong, then filtering technique works, but not too well. And to do justice here, if we were to do a real life scenario, that frequency of interest would not simply be two times less than, let's say, interferer number two. It would not be 10 times less. It would not even be a thousand times less. The real life scenario is that this frequency of interest will be 50 to 60 decibels less, sometimes 100 decibels less, from an interferer. That means 5, 6, 10 orders of magnitude below the interfering signal, and you still have to survive that. There are some more advanced techniques, where essentially the interfering signal will basically have to be killed by additional notches that will come into the system. And these are some of the more advanced scenarios, where that interferer is so strong, and it's so close to the signal, that essentially a separate notch will have to come and take it out. Let's have a real-life scenario to appreciate the numbers we're talking about. Let's say that we're trying to receive a GSM signal. Let's say that the GSM signal of interest is down at minus 99 dBm which is roughly 0.1 picowatt, and the standard says that this GSM signal has to be received, so you have to be able to get 0.1 picowatt in the presence of a blocking signal that is approximately negative 43 dBm. So there is a blocker, meaning an interference, an interferer, at the strength of 43 dBm, which is approximately 50 nanowatts, significantly stronger than the signal of interest, and this is only 600 kilohertz away from the signal of interest. So imagine that this guy here is sitting at 1 gigahertz, for example, 600 kilohertz away, we have something many orders of magnitude stronger, and yet our receiver has to work. Now to put that in perspective, this guy here is approximately 400,000 times stronger than the signal of interest. And it's sitting only 0.03% away from the main frequency. To put it more in a perspective, imagine looking at the bright sun when it's really summer, and it's very bright, and the moon is right next to it. The moon actually is about 400,000 times less bright than the sun, the full moon, and eyes can actually see the moon. That's what basically the GSM receiver can do. And, in fact, the GSM receiver can attenuate the signal that is 10 billion times weaker, can actually detect a signal 10 billion times weaker than an interferer. In that case, though, the interferer has to be 20 MHz away. So, our receivers actually are so good that we can basically detect signals of interest in the presence of incredibly strong interferers that no other systems can do. Now if you think a little bit about it, what's the big deal? Back in 1990, we created the Hubble telescope, which now has been able to find out faint stars that are magnitude weaker than our sun. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that the Hubble telescope cost about $2.5 billion, there was only one of them in the world, and it took many years to build. 
The GSM receiver is practically available for free, it works in the middle of the city, not up there in sky where everything is quiet, it works under any conditions, rain or shine, and we produce a billion of them per year. So, that's the big difference. So, these are some of the reasons why basically choosing RF transmission is quite good. Hopefully you have found the presentation useful, please subscribe for future notifications. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.